very happy that we have so many participants um, and we're going to have a great discussion. I'm, I'm sure many of you attended the opening session and it was extremely moving and invigorating and, and information packed. So I'm, um, I'm hoping that you were all able to see it. If not, um, feel free to follow up on the recorded version. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to the wonderful world of funding research. Um, we're very excited to have um, Nathan Peck and Salvador La Rosa with us. Um, but before we introduce them, um, I wanted to just take care of a few housekeeping items. My name is Pam Todd. I'm on the patient engagement team at Global Genes, and I have Susan Brizendine with me as well from that team, and she is co-moderating with me. Um, so just so you know, you will be silenced during this event, um, but we really encourage you to use the chat function to put your questions in. Um, We'll be monitoring, Susan and I will be moderating and monitoring all the questions you put in, recording them all, and we'll be passing those on live um, to Nathan and Salvador. If uh, we don't get to all the questions, we want to assure you that we're going to follow up and um, get those answers, and we will make sure that you get the responses that you want. Um, if you have technical difficulties or questions during the program, please visit the help desk. You just go back to the main lobby, click on the help desk and um, you can get answers from either the global gene staff or the tech team. Um, and finally, just encouraging you to be active listeners throughout this whole event today and tomorrow. Um, really take advantage of the opportunity to um, interact with the uh, leaders that you will meet um, during the coming events. And it's a great time to learn and get answers. Um, so I think we'll just get started. Um, I'm pleased to welcome our speakers, Nathan Peck, who is from Cure BCP, and Salvador La Rosa, who should be joining us soon uh, from the Children's Tumor Foundation. Um, we're gonna start off with Nathan Peck, and he's going to share a little bit more about his, Mac, his background and delve into the conversation further. So thank you, Nathan. Right. Thank you, Pam. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. And, you know, we all have our unique challenges. And my understanding is, you know, we're talking about research funding and research projects, how to, you know, develop your, your research plan. And as we kind of go through this, um, you know, I will, again, we're, we're new to this journey. We're only a two year old organization. And so, you know, we all have different challenges, but I'm hoping that you can gather some nuggets um, from some things we've done because we've moved pretty fast, but um, we've still got a lot to learn. And, you know, maybe through this session, I can learn from you, you know, as well. Um, I'm hoping Salvador shows up because I don't want to carry this by myself, but let me go ahead. Again, my name is Nathan Peck. Um, I am a rare disease patient. Um, I'm also the CEO of Cure VCP Disease, a founder of Cure VCP Disease, and I'm uh, on long-term disability, retired um, at this point at the age of 44, and I was diagnosed in my late 30s um, with BCP disease. So, let me see. Okay, so my rare condition, um, just real quick, I, I'm not going to touch on this too much, but I think it's always important to understand the perspective and um, where each disease and organization is coming from and what our challenges are and how we've approached it. So VCP stands for the ballasin containing protein, the P97 gene. And basically it's a, a gene that uh, regulates the unfolding of trashy or bad proteins. And when it doesn't work correctly as it does in my body, trashy bad cells start to gather up and it causes um, various um, multi-system you know, issues, you know, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, skeletal system. Um, it's also known as multi-system proteinopathy, and originally the name was IBM PFD, which stands for inclusion body myopathy, early onset Paget disease of bone, and frontal temporal dementia, which you can see at the bottom. And so I may jump between those terms, VCP disease, IBM PFD, and multi-system proteinopathy. I'm talking about the same thing. Um, it's adult onset, it's autosomal dominant, um, you find it in family. So my mom is deceased from the disease, my aunt is deceased from the disease, and I have two uncles with the disease. Uh, and at this time, it's unknown how many are affected. The key is finding families. We think less than 2,000 globally. Um, 
and I'll talk a little bit about our patient. We do have a patient registry, but many patients are misdiagnosed with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, inclusion body myositis. Um, you know, many of our patients, just like you know, many of you have gone through a misdiagnosis journey, um, and that's a challenge you know, for our organization in terms of identifying patients. We have no natural history study of biomarkers at this point, but that is our primary focus at this time. And as I talked about the different phenotypes, you know, so inclusion body myopathy, that's the uh, symptom that I have. You know, it's muscle weakness, muscle degradation. I'll probably, I'm still ambulatory, but we'll probably be in a wheelchair in another couple years. Um, you, uh, Paget's disease, so usually Paget's disease is in your 50s. Um, most patients, if you develop it, you know, start showing symptoms in your 30s. You know, the FTD shows up in um, later 50s. Um, but a patient, it, it, they're not mutually exclusive. So you can get one, two, or all three. And certain hereditary ALS has been found to be caused due to the VCP mutation, same with hereditary Parkinson's. So there's still a lot to learn about this gene, but um, I think the gene was discovered in 2004. Um, but we're, as an organization, trying to help you know, develop that. And so we started in February of 2018 we're the only patient, patient advocacy organization we know of for VCP disease and IBM PFD. We're entirely volunteer led. We have a seven member board of directors and a three person medical advisory board, three doctor medical advisory board. And our primary mission as we started was to drive disease awareness, identify the patients and help drive therapeutic development. And so some of our major milestones that we've had as an organization, I just wanted to touch on those you know, because they do kind of fall into the research piece. Uh, we started a patient registry through CORDS um, in June 2018. So we started in February. In June, we had our registry up and running, and we currently have 61 patients in that registry. We did our first ever patient and caregiver conference at Washington University in St. Louis, April of 2019, so a little more than a year later. Unfortunately, we had to cancel our conference that was planned for April of 2020, like many of you, um, so we were very disappointed with that. We just, May 5th, did an FDA patient listening session, um, which was very successful. It, it, was, it was fantastic. Um, you know, what happened, and, and the FDA expressed they had, you know, one of the directors had just heard of our disease about two years ago, but didn't understand the burden. And so being able to share that burden with, with them was very important. Um, and then we were supposed to have our first ever VCP scientific conference in North America, where we were organizing the scientific population. That was gonna take place in September of 2020 at Caltech, but we postponed that. And so yesterday we actually had our first ever uh, VCP scientific focus group. So we brought together 10 researchers and scientists together in, in, on a Zoom call and just kind of kicked off um, some, you know, what can we do to collaborate and what can we, you know, because a lot of these researchers don't know each other. They might cite each other's works, but, you know, my goal is to bring them together. Our, you know, our team's goal is to bring them together. And so that was a great first step. Very excited that that happened. All right, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I, I just, I want to highlight um, that, you know, a lot of people want to jump into research. Our approach was different. We felt like it was much more important to build credibility first as an organization and learn before we did anything from a research standpoint. You know, we've been mildly successful with our fundraising efforts and we're pleased with what we've done, but that building credibility and learning and listening um, was really important. And so at the top, you can see we started in 2018. There's been a lot of milestones, activities, things that have taken place, but we didn't award our first research grants or kind of grant activity until this year, you know, January of 2020. And so again, you know, that might not be feasible for you and your organization, but I think it's really important to consider you know, taking care of some fundamental baseline activities first before you embark upon, you know, the awarding research because you might make some mistakes in the process or that you might learn something. And so we have a patient registry. I mean, that was the most important activity for us to start first. Natural history study, you know, that was touched on today. Um, we are working our tails off, you know, because we have to get that activity going. Mouse IPSC models, that should be a half check. 
we thought that we were going to need to fund that activity and research. And once we started talking to more doctors and researchers and asking the right questions, which we didn't even know how to ask the right questions at the beginning, we've learned that there's multiple models out there. And now, you know, with this focus group that we had yesterday, maybe we need researchers working together to have the right kind of model. So that's a, you know, biomarkers and endpoints, we need that development done. Um, and then do researchers and scientists and, um, you know, do they know you? you know, that's the most important thing, in my opinion, for, for the credibility. And, you know, so the researcher networking, you know, before you award any research, you know, I would highly recommend, you know, that you use Canvas the landscape, look at the different tools that are out there. My impression when we first started this organization was there wasn't much VCP disease research. I went on NIH Project Reporter and was shocked. And one of the researchers recommended that to me. Um, I was surprised at how much VCP research was going on. And once I reached out to each, and a lot of it was preclinical, but once I reached out to those people, they were tickled to death to talk to us and work with us and speak with us. And that's why we were able to do that focus group yesterday. And so, you know, I'd highly recommend, again, Project Reporter, you know, and contact them. Most of them will be happy to speak with you. You know, we scour PubMed, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, you know, for articles. And I look at who, you know, in the first line, that first author, you know, is usually the person that did most of the work. And this is what one of the researchers explained to me, and maybe I, I'm the only person that didn't know this. The last person on it is the lab or senior advisor whose you know, um, facility it was in. Everyone else was collaborators. And so I spend a lot of time, if I find interesting articles, reaching out to that first person, you know, just to understand their work and research and what's going on in their labs or clinics. Um, so again, a, a great resource to identify the landscape. And then we really started out with exhibiting at conferences just to get our name out there, meet different researchers that we didn't know about. We had a brochure we created. Um, and so some of these pictures, you know, this is from the Muscular Dystrophy Association Science and Clinical Conference. And you know, this is Dr. Weimer from University of Florida, um, you know, Dr. Kimonis, different researchers that again, we're, we're meeting and networking. They introduce us to people. So again, we're getting a landscape. You know, this is at the American Academy of Neurology conference last May. Um, you know, and, and a researcher that we that you know knew about VCP but didn't know about us. And so, you know, establishing those connections. You know, this picture right here is, you know, it seems silly. We're at a Atlanta Falcons football game, but probably one of the most important things we did as an organization early on. So this is one of our medical advisory uh, board members, Dr. Chris Weil at Wash U. And, you know, we had reached out to him. He was excited about our organization, but we had only communicated over the phone. Um, and we went to the American Neurology Academy uh, conference that was in Atlanta in 2018, and he was there. And it just so turned out that the Falcons were playing on a Monday night, we invited him to the football game. He was happy to take us up on it, got some drinks, and, and you know what? It's broken down some barriers. I now consider him a friend, and he's been, you know, I actually spoke to him this morning, um, you know, because as I have questions, it just, you know, and there's a paper about this. I forgot to put the link um, on here, but uh, UCLA published a, a paper about it that, you know, Establish, breaking down the barriers and not where you need something from them, but where you can help them um, really helps in terms of, you know, you don't need to fund some, you know, some of those research. You can learn from them and they're happy to help because you can go out and chase things down for them. And so we offer a lot of the researchers speaking engagements on our online webinars or our conferences. Um, organizing the scientific conference, you know, is a big deal, giving them, a, you know, an opportunity to come together. And so I just, you know, I encourage you to, you know, there's ways to do it, um, you know, but, but establishing that, you know, your um, credibility with, with the, the research community is really important. All right, and last slide, you know, um, you know, we've, 
you know, learned a lot. Um, you know, our first grant that we applied for in terms of, you know, research funding or trying to award research funding was, you know, CZI Rares 1, uh, you know, and that was kind of a audacious one to start, you know, first on, but we were selected to submit a final application. We weren't selected in the end, but we learned a lot through that process, especially as we worked with some of the researchers um, on developing that. Helix, we were selected to submit a final, you know, but weren't, weren't selected and it was okay because we learned through each of those. The million dollar bike ride near the grant matching. We're not selected, you know, final for that, but we still operated as an independent team because we want to establish um, those norms that we're serious about doing that. You know, our, um, you know, really our first activity was awarding a $500 travel scholarship to a researcher at LSU to attend the AAA plus uh, Keystone Symposium, you know, and so that was a, it was more a gesture that, and she handed out our brochures at that conference to people, you know, to, to help, um, you know, ex drive exposure to VCP and to, to reach out, drive awareness. Um, so again, it can be simple little things as well. You know, we were uh, the young investigator draft. We were very excited that one of our young investigators was selected through that process. And so that was a $10,000 matching grant. So that was a big moment for us in terms of being able to award, you know, research. But it certainly some of the learnings that we did from the previous efforts helped in terms of that effort. Um, and then recently, you know, working through one of our medical advisory board members, the UCLA for our scientific conference, we were awarded $60,000 to conduct our scientific conference. Um, now we've postponed that, we've delayed it till next year because we're not gonna hold the conference this year, but again, um, just an exciting opportunity. So I, I hope that helps in terms of just framing um, what I can you know, offer in, in this conversation. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. That is such an impressive amount of uh, work and connection and accomplishment in a very short period of time. Um, we do have Salvador La Rosa with us now. Um, welcome. <laughs> um, gl yeah. So glad to have you with us. And um, Salvador is from the Children's Tumor Foundation, but I'll go ahead and let him further introduce himself and share his slides as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Pam. Uh, thank you, uh, Maureen and Susan, but also Nathan for having you here. Um, segue on your uh, very nice presentation. I think we'll, we'll, I'll cover something that you know, goes a little bit um, after what you said that is complementary. And I think even though uh, our portfolio of research activities and funding programs is, is more developed because <laughs> we've been around for about 40 years, I think the same principle applies. So let me first of all share my slide um, and let's move from there. So I hope you guys see my, um, my screen and my slide now in presentation mode. Yes, we see it. Okay, great. So as I said before, uh, the, um, the Children's Tumor Foundation is, is, we are quite mature, let's say, in the fields. We've been around since 1978. Our headquarters is in New York City. We are the largest non-governmental funder of NF research. And our mission is very broad. Um, but first and foremost, we, we, we aim at be the driver of research, the, the seed funder that, you know, um, actually make it happen um, for, for new ideas and, and grants. But we also want to expand knowledge, advance care uh, of the neurofibromatosis community. And that's why we also developed um, multiple initiatives that cover you know, a, a lot of ground in, in uh, what I think all of the participants to this, um, to this forum are looking for. But today I'm gonna focus on specific funding opportunity for a preclinical. So of course our vision is to end NF. One slide to explain about uh, NF, for those of you who don't know, is a family of three rare tumor suppressor syndrome. Uh, NF1 with, with an incidence of about one in 3,000. Uh, NF2, uh, which is an incidence of one in 25,000 people. And schwannomatosis is the rarest of the three with about one in 40,000 to one in 70,000 still not clear because very few patients um, have been identified. 
it, it affects all racial group and genders equally. And it's, it is an autosomal dominant, very highly penetrant um, that, you know, except for schwannomatosis. And the most interesting part is that 50% is genetically inherited with, you know, familial version of neurofibromatosis that's inherited from your parents. And 50% is de novo sporadic mutations that are, um, you know, appearing. So NF in general, NF1 and NF2 genes are very prone to um, accumulating um, mutations. Except schwannomatosis, which is about 85% sporadic. And then the good thing about, um, let's say good, uh, is that the NF gene are highly relevant to cancer. So looking at some facts uh, and put this into context for a broader audience, I mean, our, um, you know, what we like to put out there is that 100 kids are born every day with NF uh, in the entire world and just have very high penetrance, as I said, because 95% of patients develop these tumors. Um, because of the location and the function of the genes, they also acquire, um, you know, high susceptibility to develop other cancer than the general population. This is believed to be about twice as much on top of their NF tumors. And then, as I said before, uh, there is a highly um, overlapping of pathways so that, um, you know, NF research uh, overlap with RAS, uh, just as an example, the NF1 uh, gene product neurofibromin is, is a tumor suppressors um, pathway of the, the RAS pathway, signaling pathway. So there is a, there is a very large overlap that may help uh, cancer, but also cancer research help NF because we can find drug to repurpose. Um, as a very overall overview and what has been discussed so far, um, what, what is our strategic model? And I'll just talk about this for um, a couple of minutes. It's, it's really um, putting together um, all of these ecosystem that start with patients at the center when they first, you know, talk to their doctors. And then, you know, there are clinics that are, you know, out there that are, you know, more or less experienced in treating these this conditions. And then you have the research enterprise of basic translational and clinical research. Then on the other end, you have the commercial enterprise that are the one that you're looking at when, when, you know, when the time comes and you have solid hypothesis and someone has developed a drug or a treatment. And then of course, you need to step by the regulators, the FDA, the EMA, um, you know, to basically go back. And we see our role re really as a connector. And as I said, our mission is very broad. So it goes really 360 degrees. While we are doing all of this, of course, um, for us, there, is a, there are four main components. One is connect the community, connect the, connect the clinics, connect the, you know, the community, the research academia, and then connect them together back to the patients. Of course, one big part is fund research, catalyze research in, in the academic setting, and then help a commercial entity to enable their uh, products and also uh, talk to the regulators like you know, FDA listening sessions or um, drug discovery uh, focus group. And just to um, show what are our programs, you can see each one of these blue bubble is one of the programs that we developed at, at the foundations. So think about you know this, but you know group of clinics. We basically funded a NF clinic network that now we, we're trying to educate and, and make sure that there is an homogeneous uh, way of um, getting treated and getting their care for NF that is zip agnostic. Um, we also connect through our conference and then, you know, the main mechanism for, for funding the Discovery Fund, which is PI investigation, um, investigator initiated grants, team, science and consortium, but also this R&D enabling platform that has many components that brings these discoveries to the commercial entity, like the registry and, you know, natural history study that we're trying to build monitoring the literature for targets that are relevant for NF and look for drugs that, you know, um, act on that, on that, um, on that target, uh, creating a data hub for all research that is being made in NF, uh, preclinical initiatives that may exploit some of the preclinical model that are out there are very solid, and then clinical endpoints development. All of these are, you know, uh, we call it the R&D enabling platform. 
And then, of course, with the commercial, we're trying to see if there are business opportunity that we can invest and, and, and um, you know, get something out. But what I would like to, and you know, uh, focus your attention and what I see also, you know, saw this morning in, in Chris Austin's presentation is that, of course, at the center of everything, we go back to the patients. The patients and the patient engagement program is where is our uh, lighthouse. Um, we, we are trying to involve them with the clinics, learning from them what is the care they, they get and what, you know, we can get in exchange, what is needed to be done. The review, the, the you know, they act as reviewers and um, consumer uh, stakeholders in our grants review and assignment. But we also engage them with the commercial entities to, to make sure that they understand what they're dealing with. And then, of course, they have a, a special stage with regulators where they can uh, again, explain the, the, the disease and what needs to be done. So everything really uh, rotates in you know, towards this. What I'm going to talk today is uh, the Synodus model and the preclinical initiatives, two models that I think for funders, uh, you can scale at any point and they, they work, you know, um, at any, uh, let's say, scale point. Um, just to introduce, um, our funding um, mechanism is pretty mature. We have, you know, mechanisms that actually go in specific for basic research, like the Young Investigator Awards, uh, translational science, like the Drug Discovery Initiative, but also in clinical research space with clinical research awards. And then there are others that instead focus on um, teams and consortia. And I'm going to talk about the preclinical consortium activity that focus on translational science, and then the Synodos team that instead go across all of the three disciplines and bring together that Olympic team, you know, the dream team that needs to solve very complex problem and how you can model this too. So <clears throat> depending on the stage of the research for that specific area, um, we started this about in 2008, uh, where the, the, the field was enough mature, there were enough tools, preclinical models. So we partnered with these four labs, but also other labs. These four labs for an F1. These labs have developed a genetically engineered mouse model. And you can see here in the context of plexiform neurofibromas, AML and JML, JMML, which is an NF1 driven type of leukemia and MPNST that is also NF1 driven. These labs, um, developing these models, we thought that um, investing and in creating uh, this, creating an effort with the support of um, industry to, to test as many drugs as possible would lead us to uh, maybe identifying the best drug uh, that could you know, really be translated into the clinic. So the model was, creating observation in one model, but also having somehow, um, you know, other models that could confirm the same observation. Because as you know, most of the fields have very surprising research and results that sometimes are not confirmed in other, in other model. So this model were very good, um, you know, set to use different types and tissue context, but also comparison of early versus stage, uh, late stage tumors. And this is the sequence of, you know, how things progressed. Uh, you can see the first year we all had, you know, NF1 and NF2 models. They just tested a bunch of drugs, but this really was to set in place those standard of operations. So learning curve for the academic to work in a more like a CRO uh, or contract research organizations type of uh, setting. And then we found a second round where we had more drugs um, over a shorter period of time. And then really when we, the, the, the rubber hits the road was on the, on the third iteration of the consortium where we really um, gained steam and tested a lot of drugs. So um, at the end, 116 individual preclinical trials, we tested 49 agents in multiple combinations as well. Um, so including small molecule antibodies, antisense, immunotherapy, and the results of this uh, drug testing actually informed 16 clinical trials. Either as, you know, as a result, the clinical trial was started as a result from the preclinical testing, or it was a confirmation of an agent that was already in clinics that didn't have that step in, in, in the preclinical setting. 
Um, out of this, there was a very successful story. Um, so selumetinib, uh, which is a MEK inhibitor uh, called also AZD6244, was very early in our pipeline in the, in, in the preclinical consortium and was showing very good results. Um, so then, you know, a pr th this was quickly moved into the clinic. And then long story short, after two initial trials, the sprint trials really uh, took it to the finish line. As you can see, this is this is a graph of tumor growth. And this is, you know, when these kids actually start treatments, they can see for the first time ever tumor reduction. So uh, as an outcome, 70% of patients, they observe more than 20% shrinkage. In this case, in particular, we saw about over 50% tumor shrinkage. So this led to the, to the very, uh, very first ever drug approved for an F, uh, Cozilugo, which is selumetinib, now available and was approved last April. So the very first ever drug for our field. Going back to instead the other model. Um, so the, the previous preclinical was more like we have a very robust model, let's pump it and push as many drugs as we can into that model to see if we find the top one. The second model that is this team science is more like we need to accomplish a mission. We need really a global team of experts that will um, you know, tackle a very complex problem. So we start with patients and patients really tell us what is the main things that we need to impact on. Then we go back to the drawing board and, and, and kind of set the topics and translate into an RFA. We put the RFA on and we allow the best of basic translational and clinical research to come as a team to tackle that problem. And then everything is connected by data portal that I'll go and talk a little bit more. So it's really global, multidisciplinary expert team. It's like the Olympic team for you know, this specific problem. Um, so we started with one and then the model was really working well. So we actually you know, multiplied by six. And uh, so at the end, we did six, um, you know, um, let's say dream team on an F, an F2, an F1, two on preclinical models, one on low grade glioma, one on schwannomatosis pain, and one on an F1 panglioma. All of these models were driven in, in by, by patients, input from patients. And it took quite a little bit of money uh, over five years for all of this, but you can scale back to, you know, collaborations, very focused activities, that may take very, uh, you know, a fraction of, of, of what we did. And you can scale up as well, because if you think of uh, stand up to cancer model, um, this can go, you know, really both direction. For us, this was a very sweet spot. So each program was between two and three million. And this, this was over about one million uh, over three years, all of them. So what came out of this? And when I say you know, really um, you know, complex problem, we identify a clinical candidate now for an F2. And, on, and we, so we agreed with Takeda to test brigadinib, which is an ALK inhibitor in an F2 tumors. Results were really um, convincing to them to invest a million dollar in the clinical trials. Uh, but also on top of that, the team also developed a new basket, platform basket trials that now will allow us to also include other drugs so the preclinical model developed new pig models for an F um, and identify also new drugs. The schwannomatosis pain, unreal, you know, through the sequencing of multiple tumors, unravel new mechanism for pain. And the optic glioma um, effort that actually was the very first one that actually um, was able to collect over 100 samples and sequence them really change how clinical care of, of these gliomas are, is, is, is done in different, in different settings, different clinics. And then on top of that, we saw that, you know, there is so much effort, so much data. So we start initiating data collection and open sharing for all this project that led us also to the launch of the NF data portal. So the portal now is extended to all researchers and all of our funding, funded research, they need to agree to sharing their data um, at some point after they conclude their research, of course, we give them the opportunity to publish, but then, you know, we need to capture. So there is a centralized portal. And the good thing about it is, you know, there are different funders and multiple funders in the NF space. We managed to get on board with all of the major NF funders. So it's us, 
but also NTAP that is focused on plexiform and cutaneous, the CDMRP and FRP program, that is a congressionally directed medical research program activity specific for NF, uh, the Gilbert Family Foundations, but also programs from the NCI like the DART score. And this is a snapshot of the number of files and file type diversity of files that we have now on um, the NF Open Science Initiative and the portal. So just my last slide, um, so some takeaway from what I presented you. It's, it's really what you, you, I think is important to, to fund, keep funding the, the best investigators that have the best idea because um, they will lead the space, they will, they, will, they will create collaboration in the future. But really in the rare this is space, we need to leverage on collaboration. It's really key. We cannot really only compete in isolation and in silos. And then depending on the status of research, there are different models that can be used. And I, I think there are two main models. One is if you have a solid preclinical model, um, you should do and exploit that model um, as, as the, you know, as best as possible. Once you know that this is really, uh, is, 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 is really delivering, then use a CRO style testing, like, you know, the preclinical consortium we did. So test as many as possible of those compounds or those therapeutics. Um, and, and then, you know, there will be some, a bunch of them that will emerge as potential candidates to move forward. But it's challenging with academic centers. And I'm happy to explore that maybe in the Q and A section. And then the second one is a collaborative across discipline teams to solve complex problem. Let's say you don't have that model and you need to, you know, um, define the model. So that's, that's a typical topic for a Synodos team science approach. You bring a clinicians, you bring a preclinical expert together. They need to discuss how this model is going to work and why this model is right for clinical studies production. And then one other point is make sure that your project management, you give resources to project management. It's not trivial, it requires dedicated resources to put everybody on, you know, uh, on time, on what needs to be done, especially when you invest a lot of money. Uh, don't leave it in the, in the hands of the researchers because they have a lot of things to, you know, look after. And this is sometimes very, you know, the first things they neglect. Um, Grants should, should be regulated by contracts so that you know what, are your, what you get, what are the deliverables, what are the milestones, the main milestones you're gonna obtain from, you know, upfront. Uh, what is the IP on, on novelty, the return of investments, the use of data, what are the guidelines for using this data once this grant is completed? Make sure that you agree that you can share that, you know, what you get and everything else. And then sometimes it's difficult to manage. I mean, you can put all of the you know, experts in the room and uh, most navigated managers, but um, expectation is always difficult to, um, you know, to, to couple with accomplishments and people have different um, visions and staying on timelines. And sometimes it's as basic as knowing what they signed for and remind them uh, what are your deliverable and milestone. So I hope this was useful. And I'm happy to participate in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much. <clears throat> and, we, and we do have some questions coming through for you. Um, one of them is around how you fund. Uh, do you apply for grants? Um, do you crowdsource or do you have other sources of funding? And yeah, no, we, yeah, we have, a, um, I mean, our foundation is uh, about 30 employee. Um, 20 of them are fundraisers. So we don't have any endowment, but we fundraise heavily. I mean, all of our budget, which is about 10 to 12 millions every year is, is fundraised by events, like uh, you know, the usual gala, running marathons, uh, golf tournaments, tennis, you name it, uh, walks. So it's, it's a very um, you know, a grassroots uh, type of fundraising program. And then we're trying to tap also in um, federal government funding, but, um, I, I would say 95% is from fundraising activities. Nathan, is that true for you too? I would kill for a 10 to $12 million uh, budget, but uh, <clears throat> no, we, um, you know, it's all grassroots uh, for us. I mean, in the, you know, two years that we've been around, we've raised a little over $100,000. So we, 
you know, with the uplifting athletes, you know, put up the $10,000 ourselves. You know, the important thing about that was it was great marketing for us as well. But um, we have, um, you know, uh, we're, we started work with a grant consultant because that's kind of our next evolution and phase is to work on applying for grants. But we need to know what we're applying for. So we have much more of a clear vision and strategy in terms of what we want to go after now. And again, that's just the maturity as an organization. So, okay. Um, so for both of you, um, do you have a scientific advisory board that's helping you develop the strategy? Do you feel like you drive the research strategy and then? identify researchers to fund? How exactly is that working for you? Yeah, maybe I can. Uh, yes, of course, we do have a scientific advisory board. And we started very early, I mean, um, in, the, in, in the mid 80s with, with less than $100,000. Um, we, we, we did exactly what um, Curious BCP did, um, you know, bringing the community together with really no money. But, you know, those labs were already having some kind of you know, sustained from from their own grants, and and um, and and critically putting our little resources in in points where you know they could, uh, for instance, engage their postdoctoral research activities, mm -hmm. you know, in working with them, and then and then allowing them to stay in the field instead of moving to different uh, research opportunities. So we do have a, a scientific advisory board. We have a research advisory board that deals mainly with review of grants. And then we have also a clinical care advisory boards that uh, really deals with the clinic network and guidelines for our clinical care. And recently also a business advisory board, which is a different one that um, for all of this business opportunity that are, let's say late stage and maybe um, coming up that we don't have the skills to deal with. Okay. Yeah, we do not yet have a scientific advisory board. We're probably reaching the, you know, and even this meeting that we had yesterday, that might be the, you know, start um, of identifying people. Two of our medical advisory boards are MD, PhDs. So we do have, you know, a scientific background on the advisory board. But um, no, we're in the maturity of our organization, we're, we're reaching that point. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is a little more detailed and specific to an organization, but hopefully it will help everyone. Uh, we have several scientists working in our disease state. We struggle to locate more. We also struggle to support those we do know financially or join their efforts outside of writing support letters and man maintaining communication. Um, so first issue is they don't reach out to us, so we find them. We have to find them and maintain communication we haven't been able to fund research outside of our annual 30,000 research grant offer, so we can't give them much money. So the question is, how do we better seal the relationships and offer them funding? And what are some ways we can get more involved in the work they do? Um, maybe uh, just one, one thing that is um, as valuable as money is, um, um, being able to make the connections and being able to be a resource for, um, let's say, everything a researcher may need. So um, as, as an organization, of course, you live and breathe that disease uh, area. Uh, so you're really informed in what is the latest technology, what is the latest you know, publication that came out, what is you know, the potential relationship with uh, maybe a, 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 an industry partner that has uh, a, a potential link from the science, from a scientific standpoint to what you're doing and making those early discussions, allowing them to connect with that academic is it so connecting two partners, connecting uh, an academic researchers with a potential industry partner or someone that, you know, can learn about that disease area. Of course, 90% of those interaction will be nice to meet you. I'm learning a new thing. This is completely new, but we'll keep talking, at least you put it on there rather, and, um, and, and, and make that connection that will anyway be useful for that researcher for their career, their personal development. Mm -hmm. So allowing them to expand their network um, and refer to you as the connector, I think goes a long way. Great, great advice. Yeah. I couldn't mm -hmm. agree. I couldn't agree with Salvatore more. I, I, 
a lot of this is the soft skills piece. You know, it, it seems like, you know, money is going to drive everything. Um, it, it is, you know, actually I was having a conversation with, you know, a researcher yesterday and, and she was just, you know, awarded a very prestigious award. And it's like, you need to give us that information so we can broadcast that, you know, out there and help promote these people and, and bring them to the forefront. You know, we also identified younger researchers and gave them a, a, a forum on an online webinar. And it's funny because more of the senior scientists then email us, well, who's this person? What are they working on? You know, and so, you know, to Salvatore's point, we're kind of the conduit and, and the central piece that can make these introductions. That was the whole purpose of our meeting yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, there were certain scientists that they had heard of each other, but they've never met in person or you know, online on Zoom. And so we're the ones that are making those, those introductions. So you know, I think using social media, using, you know, clever, inexpensive ways to kind of bring these people together. And then, you know, what we were excited about with the Uplifting Athletes is that's a young investigator. And so that's somebody that we, you know, hope to be working with for many, many years. And so going and finding the talent that is out there, or maybe an advisor has some, uh, a senior you know, person has an, uh, a young investigator, you know, getting in with that person early on. Um, yeah, one other example I can think of, there was a paper that came out, somebody published, you know, she was just getting her PhD, but I reached out to her and started making introductions to companies, to other investigators, you know, to help her find that next job or opportunity. And so, again, a lot of it's just soft skills that, you know, unfortunately, and look, I, time, time is not my friend right now. So I feel more urgency than anybody because I don't want to be in a wheelchair, you know, at some point. But, you know, some of this just takes time. And so you have to build those relationships and network. So, so uh, Nathan, as a follow-up, uh, you talked about the NIH re project reporter as a way to find scientists. Do, do either of you have further advice on how to identify scientists working in your disease space? Yeah, I mean, you know, Project Reporter was a great start because I put in keywords VCP and IBM PFD and I was shocked and it actually goes back several years so you can see some history. Um, you know, and, and then it's just finding those articles. I think, uh, I can't remember, um, ResearchGate, uh, Google Scholar, you know, start putting in keywords and, and those will, you know, find those articles. And as I mentioned, that first person, you know, listed as an author is usually the person that wrote, you know, the paper. So if you can find them or, or make contact with them or use your network to help, you know, I recently found a paper written by somebody in Montreal. Um, I emailed the person, I found the email address. There's some clever tricks for how you can find some email addresses, but, um, I never got a response. So I emailed somebody else, a researcher at Calgary, to help me with McGill in Canada. And that person made a soft introduction. And now I have communication. Same thing with a researcher at Yale. They wouldn't respond to me. I used somebody else to make the introduction, another researcher to make that introduction. So, you know, again, those soft skills and just being kind of clever about it, you know, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. one other maybe one other resources that we've been using uh, recently is um, there is a database called Dimensions. It's by Digital Science, and um, even though I mean you need to pay for a license um, for you know it, it basically lists um, as a comprehensive list of scholarly publications that across the globe, not just you know PubMed, but is expanded about one hundred different one hundred million different publications. Uh, but also as very interestingly, and of course you need to enroll and talk to them, uh, a funder, um, you know, grants um, um, list and database that actually um, is global. So it's not just the NIH and US and, and private funders, but it's also, you know, from China, Japan, Europe, I mean, across the globe and they're expanding continuously. So I use that specifically for my NF research um, and, and, you know, that you get both publications as, you know, uh, Nathan said, looking at first author, last author, you know, who was involved, but also, um, you know, in terms of what kind of funding they got and the NIH reporter is one, the same information is probably duplicated, but, you know, in a different context. So it really depends which tool 
you're most familiar, but this is another alternative to So it's, did you say dynations, D-I-N-A? No, it's dimension. So Dim it's, like, yeah, um, dimensions and uh, it's by digital signs. Okay. Um, also, um, Dr. LaRosa, you talked a little bit about your, um, I thought you were going to talk about your patient registry when you talked about how you get patients' opinions. What, what exactly do you have going on there? Um, so the patient registry is, is really, I mean, we started this about seven years ago. It's, it's, it's a classical registry and we've been evolving this tool as, as we move along. And, and I think it's totally fine. I mean, we cannot build from the ground Every, you know, all of the best on wheels that we like to do. So it's, it's really an evolution. And I would, you know, also encourage this audience to, to think as, you know, just a Rolodex of names and uh, that you put together in an Excel file, maybe at the beginning, and then you move on to more opportunity to capture um, more data, more uh, nuances on, on, on that. And then, you know, when you reach let's say saturation and you want more features, you move on. So we already iterated three different vendors and evolving that stage. So we have 10,000 patients there. We mainly use for informing them about clinical trials, recruitment, uh, recruitment to study. We survey them for, uh, research, you know, for um, research studies. We already use it for about 30 different studies. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, the, the when we ask input about uh, for 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 let's say the synodos teams or you know research topics, we normally have specific workshops where um, we invite. It's an open invitation to everybody to come, and um, and you know we're trying to make a forum where we can finalize quickly. Um, you know the main topics that are different emerging and and move forward, and and then you know from those topics translate those into research programs and say, okay, this is what, you know, we'll do. And then this process is very transparent with the community and uh, trying, we, we hold the forum every year with patients, we talk about those things um, and workshop. We have also a patient engagement program. So a lot of things happening, but you don't need to think about, you know, oh my God, I'll never get there. Start little by little. Um, did you have any problems when you integrated different databases? Were there previously registries that you had to integrate? Um, yeah, I mean, every time we move data and this data upload is taking, you know, they say three months, it takes nine months. But I mean, this is the only technical issue. I mean, there's nothing we can really do. Um, it is what it is. But at the end, you know, we, we have a better product. Now we are able to, you know, send those survey on the platform um, change language, um, translate it at no cost before, you know, our previous vendor was asking $30,000 for language. Um, so we can reach larger population and, you know, not just for clinical trials enrollment, but also for dissemination of information and gathering information globally. Thank you. Um, so we're, we just have a few more minutes. Um, Nathan, could you talk a little bit about the natural history study? You said you had a, I believe you said you had a patient registry, but you're working on the natural history study. How do you go about that? <laughs> what a timely question. Um, yeah, so we're still learning, um, to be honest, about um, you know, how to go about doing the natural history study. And we feel like um, with COVID-19, and actually an opportunity has presented itself for us to utilize telemedicine to do this. For a lot of our patients, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, not, a, it's a big ordeal to get them to a, um, to a research facility. And, you know, again, we don't even have centers of excellence. So we don't have somewhere that we can really direct people. We don't have established functional outcome measures. These are all things that need to be agreed to scientifically. So, you know, we're early on, but with the telemedicine piece, we feel like there's an opportunity and, um, and I'll just throw it out there. I mean, we're talking to Nationwide Children's Hospital because they have a big neuromuscular um, initiative in terms of, you know, functional measures for the neuromuscular community. And, and we've partnered and we're talking to the limb girdle muscular dystrophy community because they're in this. And so maybe there's some collaboration opportunities. So we, um, again, if this has been last year, us trying to do a natural history study and 
we were lobbying for this at Rare Disease Week. We got an appropriation request in Congress, but you know, we didn't even know the how, how would we do it? And so again, that time and just learning, talking to other researchers, they have differing opinions about it. Um, but I think we're a lot more clear now how we need to go about executing that. So I hope that answers your question, but um, <laughs> we don't know at this point, but we're a lot more um, intelligent about how we're, you know, from a strategy standpoint, how we're gonna approach it. Uh, yeah, and, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Pam. I, I just want to make this point, and uh, maybe is a, is a use, you know useful tip for everybody who is listening. Um, I think it's important to, uh, of course, attend uh, rare disease uh, conferences and you know this kind of forums where we all share good practices. But I think to to the point of of Nathan and, and reaching out to you know extend our community and and reach out to other communities, I, I would urge all of you to to look at you know specific scientific like the ACR for cancer, for those of you that have, you know, rare cancers or uh, the Neuro-Oncology Conference and really attend also those meetings where you can find uh, those specialists, those researchers that are most involved with research in your field that will attend those conference and maybe grab them and, and it's, it's a, without, let's say, uh, spending any money in meetings and, you know, getting them together, you can have an hour together uh, with, with different stakeholders, introduce themselves and, and, and discuss what, what could be useful for your organizations and your disease space. Those are, I think, the most interesting forum that I found for, uh, for an F uh, where, you know, everybody flies to these big meetings. And if you identify a few uh, key players you want to interact with, those are the venues where it's most appropriate to uh, uh, approach them. Thank you, thank you. And it, it's uh, helpful to hear that there are opportunities now that maybe we didn't have before uh, in terms of reaching people uh, through telemedicine and, and attending conferences in different ways as well. Hopefully it will uh, make everything more efficient and um, help us move further along faster. So I want to thank both of you, Nathan and Dr. La Rosa, today for all the really great information. Um, if you have further questions, just drop them in the chat. I think we've addressed most of them. Um, everyone is thanking you and praising you, <laughs> praising the information they've received in the chat. So thanks for that. And um, the next up is a round table. So if you would like to attend, just go back to the auditorium, uh, click on into the, the auditorium and, and you'll find the information for the round tables. That's from um, 2.30 to 3.30 Eastern time. Um, just select the round table on the agenda and thank you all for attending. I'm sure we'll speak again soon.